Well, good morning, everybody. No one seems to have taken me up on that offer last week of taking me over from Jan's most important ministry in the church, and that is moving the stands away so I don't bump them over. Um, that's, a, that's something else that, that we'd love to have people uh, do. But anyway, uh, it is good to be here. It's uh, especially seeing folk who haven't disappeared for what's both a long weekend and a nice weekend. So it's great uh, to see many of you with us uh, this day. Uh, random thoughts are going through my head. I will stop letting them and I will pray as we look at God's word together instead of rabbiting on about weather and all sorts of unimportant nonsense like that. Uh, Father, thank you that we can gather here this morning as your church. We pray that you will be with us this day, that you will be guiding us with your spirit, that you will be helping us continue to hear from this wonderful part of your word afresh this day. Father, we ask that you will be at work by your spirit, helping us hear the wonderful news that you are our Father and help us trust in you more and more. Help me speak what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you were uh, trying to say, what is the, ooh, nice little croak just appeared. If you were trying to say what is the, the, the best part of being a Christian, what's the highest privilege of the Christian life, what it is you would say. Uh, a little bit like a few weeks ago when I asked you that question, what's the best passage in the Bible? And really, in one sense, there's no wrong answer to that question, uh, as long as you're saying something from the Bible, uh, uh, it, but I have my own you know, take on it. It's a little bit like this. You might have your own thing. It might be, you think one of the best things about being a Christian is, is even this, is that you get to, to, to join a church, be part of a community where you get to gather, where you get to sing praise and do all these wonderful things. Uh, some people might talk about prayer as being the best thing about being a, 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 a believer, is that you get to pray to God. Uh, some of you might talk about communion, this reminder uh, whenever we take it, that we remember what Christ has done for us. Some of you might go down a more theological path from that and say, well, it's about being justified, that, that in God's sight it's justified, never sinned. You know, the, the best way a Christian is being, having your sins forgiven. You, 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 there's so many good answers, uh, but I want to suggest the best answer, a little bit like how I said Romans 8 is the best chapter, I want to suggest the best answer for the, the highest privilege of being a Christian is that we are adopted into God's family. And that we get to call the creator of the universe our dad. Uh, there's this wonderful quote uh, from J.I. Packer. Uh, he wrote this brilliant book called Knowing God. He wrote it a very long, I, I'm going to say a very long time ago and offend half the room. This was about 50 years ago, I think, uh, which to me seems like a very long time ago. I'm getting a few head nods from the front here. And a few of you kind of looking at me like, that wasn't very long. Please stop saying that. But anyway, he wrote this book, Knowing God. If you've never read that, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, and he has this great chapter on adoption about how we become God's children. And he says this, Adoption is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as father. In adoption, God takes us into his family and fellowship and he establishes us as his children and heirs. Closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. So to be justified, have your sins forgiven, that's a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is a greater thing. Uh, I find myself agreeing with that. I mean, you can argue the toss with that later on if you really want to, but this morning we're going to hear more about this wonderful news that we have been adopted into God's family uh, when we know Jesus as our King. Uh, and so we're going to continue this series in Romans chapter 8 and, and hear a couple of things. We're going to begin there in verse 14 and hear about being led by the Spirit of God. Uh, and then we're going to hear about how the Spirit brings our adoption. We're going to hear it means we get to cry out to our Father, to our Abba Father. We're going to hear in verse 16 about the testimony that we are God's children. Really, those two are quite closely connected. And then we're going to finish with that great news that we are now heirs of God. Uh, so our passage begins uh, in verse 14 there by telling us, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Uh, 
And what you would have noticed is that, and Paul was even saying before, like, are you sure you're going to start in verse 14? Because it's kind of partway through a sentence, isn't it? Partway through a thought. And that's right, you know, it begins with this word for, a little bit like how I've drilled into you guys, what's the therefore, therefore, when you read that in your Bibles, for should also trigger something. It, it, it's clearly, he's building an argument. And there's a lot of that in Romans 8. Uh, and so really, as a reminder, because I know we all kind of, kind of jump into the series at various points, what he's basically building on here is, is what he said so far in Romans 8. This idea that he begins with that triumphant news that there's therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, that we are now declared not guilty before God by trusting his son. But of course, we couldn't do it on our own. We couldn't do it by our works. So God did this by sending his son in the likeness of, of, of sinful flesh, like as one of us, to die in our place, to condemn sin in the flesh. And then we heard uh, last week about this sort of, that there's the, the, those who live according to the flesh and those who live according to the spirit. And for those of us who are on God's team, we are now those who live according to the spirit. And because the spirit lives in us, we have this sure and certain hope that the same spirit who rose Jesus from the dead will also rise, rise, raise us from the dead as well on that day. Uh, and so now it says in verse 13, sorry, 12 and 13, right before uh, our passage this morning, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live for... Good clicking, Joel. Let's go back. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You see the link there? Those, the people who are led by the Spirit of God are those who by the Spirit are putting to death the misdeeds of the body. That's what it's talking about in this instance. Uh, now, if you've been uh, part of a church at any period of time, uh, and, and, and we've, if you haven't figured out yet, we really do come from a diverse background of, of church backgrounds here in our uh, congregation. But some of you would have heard of this language of being led by the Spirit quite a lot in, in your background. It's, it's a catchphrase a lot of Christians use. And, and it can be a really helpful one. It says it here uh, in Romans 8. It says it as well in Galatians 5 as well. It talks about walking by the Spirit. The only problem is when we start getting a bit misguided in what we mean by what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? To be sure, it means be prayerful. Be sure, it means seeking God's will when we have big decisions. Sure, be praying about it. Be trying to figure out what it is. But primarily, in its context, it's talking about putting to de death the misdeeds of the body. And so, at the very least, what walking by the Spirit or being led by the Spirit should mean for you is holy living and living God's way. And if it doesn't end up that way, we've got a problem. Uh, now, at the comical end of the scale, I've, I've, I've read recently about this. It was this really old, I'm going to, everyone will agree, pretty much really old. It was from the first part of the 20th century, I think maybe 1910s or 20s, this, this Quaker work uh, on, on what it might mean to be, be led by the Spirit. And this lady wrote about how um, the way that she lets the Spirit take control of her life is every day when she wakes up in the morning, she prays that God's Spirit will lead her in what she does. So first thing is whether or not she gets out of bed. And so she lays in bed until she feels prompted by God that it's time to get out of bed. Uh, now some of you struggle to make it to an 11 o'clock service. I don't know if that's because you are so godly that you're waiting for God to prompt you to get out of bed. Um, but, but then she goes, once she gets out of bed, she then will seek God's will on what clothing she should or should not wear. Some days, apparently, the Spirit tells her to only wear her right shoe and not her left shoe. Some days she wears her shoes but not her stockings. Sometimes she wears her stockings but not her shoe. What is that? Like, I, I can't even comprehend how, how bonkers a life you'll be living if that's how you're going. Like, there is an element where God has given us a brain to use that actually tells us, you know what? You're meant to get out of bed in the morning because we've got things to do. And you put clothes on because... You put clothes on. And you know, it's cold outside, so you put warmer clothes. Like, this isn't something that we need the, the leading of the Spirit. To, the Spirit is trying to lead us to, to holy living. And that's really important as well to, to get our heads around, because I've also heard people who have then somehow got to the point where they said, well, because I prayed about it, because I felt good about it, 
then it was okay for me to go and do... And I've heard some, some... Like, I've heard people say that it seemed like God wanted me to have an affair with that person over there. Now, I'll clarify for the camera, especially for my wife, who's about to watch this later on. I'm pointing at a wall right now. There's not a person that I'm now pointing to. Right? God's pretty clear in this book that, 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 that adultery isn't what he wants us to do. Uh, the spirit who authored this thing is rather clear on this matter. It's not going to tell you, don't give you a green light to enter an affair, is it? That is your flesh speaking, if you think that way. If you think the Spirit's telling you, you know what, I actually think I should probably start spreading some rumours about some people, maybe maybe talking badly about other people in the church, maybe helping people you know, hear how bad things are. But that's probably not the Spirit at work there. That's probably the flesh at work, isn't it? Right? I just, I, it feels like ridiculous that I have to say some of this, that being led by the Spirit is about holy living and not just about getting a green light to do whatever feels good to you. But somehow we've, we've got a bit astray in this regard. But what he is telling us is that those of us who are led by the Spirit, who are good in death and misdeeds of the body, are the children of God. And this will keep going. Uh, Paul will then tell us more about being the children of God. He says in verse 15, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Uh, this is this, this wonderful news that because we have received God's spirit, we have now become his children, that we've been adopted in his family. We're no longer slaves uh, to fear. We're no longer, in, in, in the quick summary, it's no longer, we're no longer under the law. We're no longer trying to earn our salvation in any way, shape or form. Rather, we have been adopted into God's family by his grace. Uh, again, this is one of these moments. There's going to be a few moments this morning of a bit of extra explanation going on, but uh, this is one of these passages which sometimes kind of becomes a stumbling block to people because of the language used. Uh, I know many of us read from slightly different translations of the Bible. They're all very, more or less, pretty, pretty good. I can, if you want to talk about Bible translations all the time, I'm happy to. Uh, I use the NIV. Uh, some of you use an old NIV. Some of you use an ESV or an NLT, whatever. But what you'll find is it'll use different language in these couple of verses. Some of your Bibles have just said, uh, for example, in verse 14, it said, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And here in verse 15, it says, the Spirit of God doesn't make you slaves, but rather you've received uh, the spirit of adoption to sonship. Whereas others, your Bible says sons and daughters throughout it, or it says children throughout it. You know what I mean? There's this sort of gender issue going on in what words are used, especially with passages around adoption. And so just a quick kind of summary point is translating is really hard because you're always going to make someone upset over an issue like this. So literally, the word for adoption to sonship uh, the word, Greek word for adoption is this word that's like a compound word in Greek for two words, son and to make or to place, to put, to set. In other words, the Greek word for adoption, a, a, a literal translation of it would be to be made a son. Why? Because in that culture, uh, what adoption was really about was passing on an inheritance in particular. And so, who was it that, that owned property? Well, it was the father in this context. And he, what he would do is adopt a, if he didn't have, especially if he didn't have a male heir, then he would adopt a male heir, make them his son, so that then they would become what, his legitimate child and inherit everything. That was the cultural context going on. And so, when your Bibles um, speak about and uses son the whole time, what it's trying to get at is this idea that when God adopts us into his family, it's like we become a son in that context where you receive the full rights of being a child of God and you receive inheritance. You become a fully legitimate member of God's family and all the benefits that flow from that. And so that's what it's getting at. But what you also have to remember is that this also applies to our sisters in Christ too. And so... It, when, it's, it, it, when it says sons, think it also means sons and daughters, but it's trying to link in with that context where in that culture, it was the son who received everything. 
Meanwhile, if your Bible talks about only says children of God or it says sons and daughters, it's quite helpfully trying to highlight that, that men and women get to join God's family and receive all the benefits. Just remember that, that there's this technical term going on where when, when we're adopted, we receive all the kind of rights and privileges like the male heir would have in that Roman culture that Paul is writing to in this letter. That is my two-minute summary of a very complex issue. Again, feel free to ask more questions later on about that. But let's actually get to the bit you want to get to, the good news part of it, the, the blessings from it, rather than the geeky technical stuff. Because what we benefit from is these things. First of all, being adopted into God's family means we get to cry to our Father. It says there, by him we cry, Abba, Father. I just said then, we finished all the technical geeky stuff and then we move on. But, there's, but again, Abba is not a word that we are... If you've been to church for some time, you've probably heard this. In fact, I think we spoke about it online a couple of times last year. But Abba, for those of you of a certain vintage, isn't meant to be getting you to start humming Waterloo or Dancing Queen in your head. Uh, it is not a reference to uh, the Swedish band, but it is, of course, this Aramaic word, uh, the language that Jesus would have spoke, and it is a word for, well, father. But it's a tricky word to translate, really, into, into English. What it, what it, the, it's nuance of it is, it, it's something that, if, you, if you've heard any sermons on this, you've probably heard this wide range of... of of meaning for the word, because some say it's the word of like a little infant child. It's like, it's, you know, it's like saying dada, you know, it's like abba, dada, that kind of idea. But the problem with that is that like adults say this of their adult parent. They still, so, so it's not just meant to be gibberish, but it is meant to pick up on that familiarity of the word. But it also has the respect that maybe the word father has in English. Uh, now, I don't know what your context is, what you would call your you know, male parental figure, um, if you were blessed to, to know them, um, but uh, for, I think most people I meet don't call their, this person their father, right? They might reference them as father to someone else, but in their own relationship, they wouldn't call them father, because that's a bit distant and a bit odd. Certainly would be in my case, my dad is my dad, I just said that. Didn't I? I've never called him father before. That would feel odd. That would feel very impersonal. But it is very respectful. So you meant to hear the respect of father, but the kind of intimacy and familiarity of, of dad or daddy, and kind of combine them into one, and you've got the word Abba. Is that nice and confusing for you? In other words, he's your father, he's your dad. That's the idea we're trying to get at here. It's a, it's a respectfulness, but also a familiarity and a closeness all wrapped up into one. And it is wonderful news for us as God's people. Because we get to cry out to the one who made all things, the, 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 the God who's seated on the throne, and get to re reference him as dad. And all the intimacy that, that's tied up with that is just wonderful. And it's this incredible blessing we have as the people of God. And, and, and it says there we get to cry out to him. Now, cry is something that it, 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 it tells us kind of the whole wide range of emotions is when we can address God in prayer. It can be just the mundane things you want to bring before God, but it can be the, the absolute, the shocking times in life, those times when you really are crying, when you really have no words to say. In a couple of weeks' time, we'll even hear about how the Spirit will intercede for us when we have no words to say because life is so hard. But we get this privilege that we get to cry out to God and call him our Abba, our Father. And it does something really interesting. It does what, what, what it says in verse 16. It, it helps test this. It's this testimony that we are God's children. In verse 16, Paul writes that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So, kind of funny thing that's going on in prayer. We don't talk about this very often. We, when we try and think about why it is we pray, we come up with lots of different reasons why there are good reasons to pray. We, we, we pray to God because we, we, we want to give, bring praises to Him. We want to give thanks to His goodness. We want to ask for things as well. We, we, of course, we do it each week here. We confess our sins as too. But, 
there's actually something else going on in prayer that we often neglect. You see, it's meant to actually draw us closer to God. And it helps us trust and believe more and more who we are. You see, what it's getting at there is the spirit, as it, as it enables us to cry out to God as our dad, as our father, it reminds us that we are God's children. It's, 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 it's testifying to our own spirit as we do so that we are children of God and we receive all the privileges that come from that. See, I reckon I'm preaching to the choir when I say sometimes in the journey as Christians, you've been a Christian for any more than probably six months, you've experienced this. There are times when God feels distant, when God feels remote, when, when, it, when it feels like you're struggling to feel that intimacy, where it's, it, it's a struggle to think of God as dad. And I want to suggest, more often than not, when we go through those times, if you were to honestly assess your own prayer life, you would realise that actually my own prayer life hasn't been going that well during those times. That I've rarely been coming before God and, and praying to my Father and speaking to Him. So it's not particularly rocket science in that sense. There, there's often this close correlation between the, the more we pray, the more we are trusting and reminding ourselves that we are the children of God. And the less we are praying, the less we are spending time with God, the more distant we finally I feel. And we know that works because we know that just works in just about every human relationship we have as well, don't we? When we talk to people, we grow closer to them. When we don't talk to them, we grow distant. And this works with our, our dad as well. And it also works in how we address him. Uh, it's often quite interesting to hear how people pray. If you ever pray for people, you, you notice how they address God. And there's this in one sense, it's not necessarily a right or wrong. There are lots of great ways that we can address God. I, I hear people just generically say, you know, dear God, remembering that he is the creator. Maybe some people would address him as Lord, remembering that he is sovereign, that he is in control. Almighty God, expressing his power over, over our world. There, there, are, there are different ways of addressing God. But if your prayer life is only really using that language, then you're missing something really special. Because the, the really wonderful thing about being adopted into God's family is you now get to address him as dad, as Abba, as father. And it, and it reminds and it testifies to us that we are the children of God and the benefits that flow from that. It is something wonderful that we have as Christians. When you think of, of, of other religions, Muslims, for example, I think I'm right in saying that in, Quran, in the Quran that there's something like 99 different addresses for Allah, different, different names for him, but none of them even come close to corresponding with Father. There is something so intimate that we have. And, and if you think, oh, this sounds a bit weird, this sounds like Paul taking us into a, a journey of intimacy that seems a bit too close to God. But I, do I need to remind you that this is also how our Lord taught us to pray? You know, that prayer we pray every week here, our Father. Jesus wanted us to address God as our Abba. Paul is reminding us that we have to address God as our Abba. That is this wonderful, highest privilege that we get to come before God as our dad. And then the last blessing that we receive, it's certainly not the last blessing of all the blessings of adoption, but in Romans chapter 8, the last one that we're looking at in these few verses, is that we are now heirs of God. In verse 17, it says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Uh, now some of you will be sneaky and keep reading what I didn't highlight and say, that sounds pretty interesting. It does. We'll look at this whole idea of sharing in Christ's sufferings next week. But for this morning, we are just reminded again that being a child of God means that we've received the full rights of inheritance like a son did in that context. We receive everything that is the Father's. We have this sure and certain hope of inheriting. And of course, for us, that means the life, it ultimately means the life to come and entering into his glory, that place that we speak of so often, where there'll be no more sickness, no more death, no more crying, no more pain, where it will be perfection, where we will live in this perfect relationship with our Father, where we'll live in this perfect relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and it will be a glorious, glorious thing. There's a, um, a story that, that I've heard 
I've heard it several times now. I've read it in a couple of different books, and but I've only heard preachers tell it, Australian preachers tell it. So I don't, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's still a good story. So we'll run with it. Uh, I've never been able to, 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 to you know, confirm this story, but it's a, a, a story about from several years ago. Uh, apparently, the Governor General uh, on Christmas Eve invited all these people into the, into the residence. Uh, and it wasn't just any old people, but it was, it was the down and out. It was some of the, the homeless uh, living nearby. Anyway, so the media caught wind of this and they, they interviewed this, this one uh, homeless teenage boy on the way out and asked him, well, what was it like? And of course, he was, he was just blown away. Like, it was amazing. You know, I'm, I'm walking through these, these gardens, these lush gardens, and, and the food. I mean, here's a kid who's scrounging to find anything to eat, and he's got these, you know, wonderful chefs preparing him endless food, and he's gorging himself on this Christmas feast. As a Christmas feast, the governor, I mean, it'd be incredible. And, and apparently as well, there's a swimming pool, and I mean, he didn't have anything to swim in, but he was able to borrow a pair of trunks and got to go for a swim in this lavish pool, and he said, it was just, it was just, it was the best. And so one of the reporters then said to this boy, that sounds amazing, it sounds like you had the, the, the best Christmas ever. It, could anything have made it better? Apparently, without missing a beat, this boy said, I wish he would adopt me. It's no good having one lovely day like that when you have to then go back out again, is it? But he wanted that to be his existence. Friends, how much more so is that our story? And how much better is our story than that story? We, we don't get adopted by the Governor General, who, with all due respect, is more of a figurehead and, and you know, will be, has a, doesn't have endless power or even an endless reign. But we've been adopted by the one who made all this. The one who is in control of our universe. We have been adopted into his family. And when he did so, of course, I mean, without trying to judge this, this, this homeless boy, but I think our, 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 our sort of default in society is we think of him as being the lowly, right? We, that's, that's, that, that's what we think of him as. And yet we are far lower than him when it comes to what our status was before God. We were God's enemies. We were not living his way. We have nothing to offer at all. And yet God, in his mercy, he, he not only declared there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not only did he send his son to die for us and for our salvation, he could have made us right with him and left things as they were. He could have said, all right, I now declare you're not guilty. Go off on your way or even now serve me, but from a distance. But instead, our God, in his kindness and in his love, he wanted to be with us. He sent his spirit into us to live in us and to remind us afresh each day that we are now part of his family and that we get to call the creator of the world our dad. How much more so have we benefited from the wonderful news of being adopted into God's family? Friends, I know some of, us, some of us, we struggle to remember this. We struggle to, to, to let this truth impact us and change us each day. Because we, we, life gets to us. Life can be hard. We can forget how great our God is and how much of a benefit we've received by being in Christ. There's a, um, in that book I recommend at the start by J.I. Packer, he has this summary of, 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 of almost like a little little kind of, I don't know how to describe it, like a little motto to, to say to yourself or to preach to yourself, because sometimes that's what we have to do, to preach to ourselves again and again, to remind ourselves of the wonderful news of the gospel and of being adopted into God's family. And this might be something you want to, you know, write on a sticky note and put up on the wall somewhere or put in your journal or whack on your phone or whatever it might be, but just to remind yourself of this wonderful truth of who we now are in Christ Jesus. It says this, I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. 
My saviour is my brother. And every Christian is my brother or sister too. Can I encourage you, friends, to, 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 to preach that to yourself, to remind yourself what your true identity is now that you are in Christ Jesus, now that you've been adopted into God's family. I'll say it once more as we finish up. I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My saviour is my brother. And every Christian is my brother or sister too. Let's pray to our dad and give thanks to him for how great a God he is. Our heavenly father, our, our dad, we give you thanks and we give you praise that in your kindness and that in your mercy, you have given us life in your son. When we were hopeless and we were helpless and we were without any chance in life, you came and rescued us in your son. Who condemned sin in the flesh so there would be now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you have given us your spirit to change us and to make us more like you each day. And you've given us your spirit that reminds us that we can now call you our Abba, our Father. And we ask and pray that this spirit will continue to mould us and to shape us into Christ's image, into the image of our big brother, and to enable us to live for you and to continually remind us that we are yours. And we thank you for this sure and certain hope that because we are your children and we are heirs, and we have the hope of heaven as our home. In Jesus' name we pray. And thanks for your wonderful love. Amen.